Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our third Thursday lunchtime lecture. Um, my name is John Matthewson. I'm the curator here, and I'm really looking forward to today's talk. Um, there are a whole bunch of local history topics that I'd love to know more about, but no one's done the research, so I figure I'll have to do the research someday. But then someone brought me to the attention of the Journal of Early American Numismatics for um, June 2021, and the article in it by a woman called Julia Casey about the crane ring of counterfeiters in Rupert, Vermont, and I thought, I don't have to research now. It's been done. And then I thought, why don't we get her here to be a speaker? There's always more to learn. And you can do it. I'm sure you figure out something that I couldn't find. Well, there's so many rabbit holes, you know, so to go down. Yes. But um, so she's here. She's today. Um, today's speaker, and I'm really happy to introduce her. She is a numismatic researcher and on the editorial board of the journal. Of early American numismatics, and without any further ado, please welcome Julie Casey. So happy to be here. Um, so here we go. Um, starting my when I started my research into the Crane Brothers, basically, I had said to talk a little about this before. I was I knew about, of course, the famous Reuben Harmon Mint in Rupert. He had gotten authority to coin the, the coins in 1785 and. It's well documented, and these coins are very popular with numismatists, and they're beautiful, especially the landscapes, as we know, <laughs> and, uh, and just um, a real piece of early American uh, colonial, post-colonial, colonial era um, collectibles. And so I started to look into the mint, and because I'm a metal detector, too, I love to, to do it. And I have been to Nathan's Mills, which is in Newburgh, New York, and that was another mint site which was associated, and I'll talk more about that. But I got in thinking, wow, um, it'd be great to metal detect around the mint in Rupert. So I started looking into the history, and there's one of the beautiful coins. <laughs> so you see, that's the Vermont landscape, and that's a really nice example, and they're so lovely. Um, so you can see the 14th star, because Vermont, you know, it's the 14th. So um, the 14th state to come into the Union. And, but this was minted before that. So it's been seven years ago with that. And then this is a counterfeit of that coin. <laughs> and this has been like a mystery. So you notice it's like, you know, the, oh, sorry, go back. The brassiness, oh, I'm going backwards. <laughs> the brassiness compares comparatively. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I'm not used to this. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Okay, so you got a beautiful copper, and then you have a brass, and it's got all sorts of interesting features. So this has been a, a kind of a mystery. People knew these were out there. There's very few of them, but they're like, where, where did these come from? Um, pe people were, you know, thought you know, maybe they were a little bit more modern creation, but then they're like, gosh, these really look like they were made you know, closer to the time that the, the real coins were made, but they were made someplace that didn't have a lot of expertise. <laughs> there were a lot of you know fine equipment available to them as far or just we're, we're not to the standards definitely of what we thought these were. So I started with the Hibbert's Rupert historical um, and descriptive book, and I was reading along. I read about the Harmon section, and then I got to this section that says illegal coinage by the crane. And I'm like, what is that all about? So and it says about 1800, and immediately I'm like, gosh, you know, um, that's probably not so stated. It's 1800. Um, Harmon was in the 1780s. Um, so I'm not sure what's going on here. So um, I started to kind of, you know, to say, I'm going to look into it anyway, because I'm interested in counterfeit coinage, and um, I want to know what these guys are doing. So I went from there. There's a little bit of information there. And they provide some colorful information about the cranes, which was kind of a fun way to get started with doing the research. So I, so I started kind of checking. This is just to give us an overview so we can kind of see that um, where I believe the cranes were located, which is number one, and then two and three were the areas where Harmon was minting the coins. So around there, we're going to get through that, just kind of the idea. All right, so we have a lot of So, all right, so the cranes come in from what Hibbert says, the cranes come into town and it made it, he made it sound kind of like that they were kind of newcomers to the town and they, they were, people were noticing them because they were dressed 
really rich lady as compared to, to the rest of the townsfolk. And there's a thing I, I'm not detecting. So you can see that middle piece is, it. we call that a dandy bunny. And they're big buns and they're so cool to find. And they're from the late 1700s, dated. You, know, you can see these men here wearing those. They are, they're not as functional. More, they were just, you just can be all came in all sorts of different patterns and, and metals and they're just, some of them are just beautiful. And I was really proud of that one I found the center because you can see it's not perfect, but it has a lot of the gilt left. And it came out really nice because that was buried for, you know, for 200 years and I found it in the back, actually my back of my property out there in Saratoga <laughs> County, New York. So <laughs> that was a neat one. So these are just examples. So, so the Crees, we know from what he's saying, the legend is these guys stuck out. Just, they were dressed well. And then he tells the story. <laughs> um, <laughs> the food is this is not an actual depiction of the event, but this is to show you that um, we have Judge David Sheldon, who I think is um, a pretty prominent person in Rupert history. Um, and he was involved, he provided money or assistance to Reuben Harbin to get the coinage contract. And he became interested in the cranes when they were in town and he he thought they were up to something. So he, I think he was watching them. And the story that Hibbert provides is Judge Sheldon was coming home uh, late at night and he looked up on the mountain and he saw a light. And so he decided he was gonna check it out. And he got up there and took with some townspeople and um, they, well that's the next thing, they had, they said what's coming next. But previous to that, there was some animosity between Sheldon and Crane because Sheldon had defeated uh, the Reggie Crane at a wrestling match, and Hibbert liked to throw that in there to show that, just give us a little personal touch of the relationships between these men and the people in town. So, they, Judge Sheldon, <laughs> he got the people, and they came up to the mountain, and they broke up the Crane's minting operation. And so they say they took that minting machinery, and they destroyed it, and they buried it on the mountain. And uh, it's this feeling that it's sitting there. And if anybody has any ideas of how we can go up there and look for it, I would be all for it because I think it's the coolest thing. All right, and so then we get the facts. So I started to look for the cranes, try to find them, you know, find information. What was going on? Were these, you know, what is the story? Try to figure out what time they were doing this, really, because it said about 1800. And I started to find this, we noticed this in the newspaper, and I find Adonijah Crane, who had been in, in, taken in. For counterfeiting, and that's in Litchfield, Connecticut. And Adonijah Crane, and luckily enough, it's a pretty unique name as far as the, his first name goes, and so that really helped with the research. <laughs> so then he also had his brother Francis, who as well had an, was taken in 1788, and he was out in uh, what was he then? They're all a place, uh, Cheshire. They were they were in New Hampshire. They were in Connecticut. They were kind of like all over the place. So, and then I started digging into the records of the Continental Congress, and I found these depositions. And there's people talking about the cranes, and they're talking about going to their houses and how they would get bring notes, um, settlement notes to them, and Adonijah would change would change them. And they, what they do is raise the amount. He was a really good engraver with penmanship, and these these notes are pretty basic. So he would. He would had a real ability to to do to change these paper documents so to to make them higher, and it became big, um, a very popular way <laughs> for people to kind of increase make some money there. Um, so then we have this comes to the attention of Alexander Hamilton, and this is where it gets big. So we have this um, Jeremiah Wadsworth, and he's writing to Hamilton, and they're interested now in the, the cranes because there's a lot of, of fake paper money floating around, and they're trying to figure out what's going on, and they're zeroing in on the cranes, and they're, at this point, this became really interesting to me because you'll see in the letter, it says, last night a man returned from Rupert in the state of Vermont with information that the cranes were there and had counterfeited the banknotes of New York. So they know at this point, the, we know that they, they're, doing counterfeiting in 1788. We know that they're here in Rupert. And this is a good 10 years before the about 1800 that Hibbert thought they were here. And this is so important because this places them here when Harmon is minting the coins or 
really close to the time. And this creates a whole new aspect of what the cranes were doing and why they were here. So this got me really interested. <laughs> so I get into more. Okay, so they were, they came out of, they went, the cranes ended up in Vermont and we think they were kind of hiding out here because we knew Hamilton was interested in them. They had depositions going on. Um, they're trying to capture them, but Vermont wasn't a state yet. So we're, <laughs> we're thinking they're hiding out here, kind of, they have a little protection. But they leave Vermont because they have they have other work to do, and they're still doing their business. And they they get out, um, and they're um, they're in Worcester, Mass. And you know this notice comes from Springfield, and they caught them. So they're, they're they send them into New York City, and they're going to prosecute the cranes. But <laughs> oh, this threw this back. I'm a little out of order here. This is just to verify. In 1790, we do see the cranes are on the census for Rupert. So. So they're in, they're in New York captured, and um, there's this letter that somehow gets out. Adonijah Crane's writing to Rupert. He's writing to his friends or family here, and they put the, somebody gets this letter and they publish it in the Vermont Gazette, and everyone's all alarmed and they're thinking, um, you know, they, they know these guys. They, there's you know kind of like I think probably half and half people who are supporting them in certain ways or their friends or family and then people who are a little shocked at what was going on and, and are you know not really into the counterfeiting aspect of what the cranes are up to so so he writes this detailed letter and it's pretty interesting he talks about what it's like there in prison in, in New York and he is telling them all that he's going to get acquitted and he knows he's going to get acquitted and basically he's going to because he's found a way to intimidate anybody who's going to provide evidence against him to to not come forward, and he push they push somebody down the stairs of the, the prison. They're talking about Mr. Willard, who was, I uh, think it's an Ephraim Willard, who was a had been a clockmaker. Okay, so here they are. They got acquitted, so they were able to get away with it. It's um pretty amazing how they were able to do this, but. Um, I don't know if these court records are available, but I probably should go ahead and see exactly what happened. But, but they ended up, just as they said, they, they were not prosecuted at this time. But then we get a more interest here because they get caught again, and it's really Francis this time who gets involved. And this case becomes a kind of a major case in American legal history because what happened was um, John Jay was trying to get permission to get um, someone to, one of the, mem the people involved, Dr. Freeman, to turn state's evidence in. He needed, he needed George Washington to approve it. And he wrote to Washington, but the, it, Washington didn't reply in time. And by the time he got the message allowing it to happen, the trial had already happened in Trenton, New Jersey, and everybody was set free. So, <laughs> so it became a rather interesting thing. And, um, and so they're off again. So, the, so you know, the Cranes got away again, and, and now, um, we have kind of some background on the cranes and what they're doing and how this is, they're everywhere. So we know they're in New Jersey, they were in New Hampshire, they're in Connecticut, and in Vermont. Um, so they're it's kind of a, a big, it's a big deal that it's in, um, haven't really got a lot of attention when people are studying this, this era in American history. All right, so we kind of flip back a few years. We have the cranes, now we, we're thinking that the cranes could be in Rupert around 1788-ish or so, and I'm trying to figure out what that all means. And we have the agreement of 1787, where the Vermont Mint, which is Reuben Harmon, you can see his name right on top there, and he and his partners, which are listed below him, are William Coley, Elias Jackson, and Daniel Van Voorhees. And then below that are the names of members of another mint in New York, the Newburgh and Machen's Mills Mint. And those are um, Atley, both Atleys, and we have um, the other one, the Thomas Machen's at the bottom. These other people were kind of more providing financing and stuff, Breyer, Giles. They, these, they joined together to mint coins. And you're gonna see here what happened after they did that. This is what the coins now look like. They took, they took away the landscape, and now we have kind of like a, a counterfeit British half 
penny. It Tory takes it, but it does have Vermont. If I'm not a Tory for the authority of Vermont. So you see that when that after that agreement took place, we lose our beautiful landscapes and we have the, the coins that don't really seem to be being produced that were written more. They look different. There's, there's something going on here. So what could what could have happened? Um, we have this man, Elias Jackson. <laughs> so, um, Elias Jackson is one of the people listed on, on the Vermont, with the Vermont people. We had Harmon, we had Coley, we had Van Voorhees, and we have Elias Jackson. Everyone knows Harmon, he was this, you know, from Rupert, well, he was actually, he wasn't directly from, but he was living in Rupert. He's the one who set them up. Coley and Van Voorhees, silversmiths, um, <coughs> They were originally from New York City, more so. Van Wory stayed there, but Colby came here uh, to this area to live, and he become kind of a prominent man in this area as well. Um, so they were involved with more of the mechanics of the mint. But we don't know what Elias Jackson was doing. Who, who is, he was just said to have been from Litchfield, and no one really looked into him to figure out what his role was, who he was. And so I, I was giving that on him, and I was like, I'm going to look into what this guy was. So, um, I, you know, I found out he was Salisbury area, Litchfield. There's this notice in the newspaper where he mentions that he's got um, he's got a stallion, and he's going to be moving it into Vermont. And I'm like, okay, that's interesting too. Um, he looks like he's he's also coming into Vermont along with the other ones. Um, so. I focused more and more, and that got me into uh, um, popping in next the 1792 letter, which was like the most fascinating thing. This Alexander Hamilton got a letter from this Benjamin Talmadge, who was the um, postmaster in, in Litchfield, and he's writing this really just fascinating thing, where he says he um, they took into custody this guy named Jackson, and they don't give his first name. But they said that he was a notorious horse thief and just a ne'er do well, basically. And but this Jackson revealed to them, um, well, this Jackson they know he's part of the cream ring. They, 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 they say that they actually say they're in there. And and Jackson goes on to detail the headquarters of the cream ring, and he's talking about this cave, and he's talking about the massive counterfeiting that they're doing. He said the cave is located along the North River, the Hudson. Um, the way it sounds, they don't really specify, but given the Litchfield, I assumed it was more like Dutchess County area of New York. So he, he goes into great detail about it, and it just sounds like this major thing. They're gonna, they're, they're, they're actually have ships coming up the river that they're gonna send stuff to the West Indies. They have their machinery coming in that they're gonna make gold coins, and it's just massive. So. This Jackson, and I'm like, Jackson, I know that's a common name, but gosh, I don't know. <laughs> it's Elias Jackson, and then I get this. I get Elias Jackson of Salisbury in Litchfield, Connecticut, in 1798, is convicted of forgery. <laughs> and this is in Dutchess County, or Dutchess County, I think, in, in, like, no, Delaware County, New York. And I'm like, my gosh, this is the guy, this is, this is the same guy who was, um, that, Talmadge is writing about, and he said he's the same guy who was involved with the, the Rupert Mint and the Nation's Mills, and, and, and he's part of the Crane Ring, and he's also now connecting the, the Crane Ring to the Vermont Mint and to the Nation's Mills people, and it creates this whole new numismatic web as far as, as, far as history, but now we like think the Cranes were involved with these producing these, con these copper coins that were being issued in New York and in Vermont, and what purpose did the cranes serve in this? It becomes a big mystery, and I mean, I mean so much to study. Um, and But that was just like a major connection that um, I feel pretty con confident is, uh, is accurate, and what really, what happened, and, um, and uh, it was, Quite or shed, and when I found it, I was all by myself, and I was, <laughs> I was like, "Oh my god, <laughs> amazing!" I can't get it together. All right, so then we get into this, and I threw this on the side. I just put this in recently. 
So um, we were talking about the, the Sandgate um, excavation going on at Egg Mountain because there is this um, community abandoned settlement and the researcher there, Steve Butts, is trying to connect, uh, has connected it. We know that Daniel Shays from Shays Rebellion, because uh, that happened in Western Mass, he moved afterwards, they, they moved, he moved into Sandgate. Um, but fortunately, you know, the, the government did not prosecute him. It, it, so it's kind of, I think, to kind of keep the peace and, you know, they let him go into Vermont. But um, the opinion, uh, you know, the kind of the view is that he was still kind of on guard and there was still a lot of, of uh, anim you know, just conflict, potential conflict going on because, um, you know, Chase was, there were the, the farmers in, in Western Mass that were being overtaxed. And so it was like a mini, you know, American Revolution taking place on a more local scale. There were same kind of reasons, the same kind of um, impetus going on there, but um, it, it, it didn't succeed, obviously. I mean, they tried, I think it was the Springfield Armory, they were trying to get, they were gonna, um, almost were able to get some armaments there and do more, but it ended up just kind of getting put down. But some interesting things about the Shays thing is not only, you know, were they rebelling physically that way. There also was a lot of um, counterfeit coinage going on in Western Mass. A lot of production of counterfeit Spanish silver. Um, so it would have been made of tin, pewter, white metals, or maybe sometimes they would um, put a silver wash over brass or something. So I came across the website <laughs> for that settlement from the Egg Mountain Summit, and I saw this coin there, and I was like, oh my gosh, that looks like a counterfeit to me. Um, it just, it's hard to tell the people, <laughs> not a but it, and the whole, they were thinking the whole was so it could be used as like a pendant or something, but uh, sometimes with counterfeits, what they do is um, if someone got one and, and they would take it as kind of a, um, just to, as a display and they would take it, if it was in a shop or something, and they'd nail it to the wall. <laughs> uh, so there's, counterfeits are found that way. A lot of times it's in the center, so this could have been. Um, but the really interesting thing to me too is that this, it's hard to see, but over the side is the denomination and it says 4R, which means this is a four reals coin, which is really unusual to find. And a counterfeit is even more so. You see the eights, which are bigger. The eights are, are the dollars that people maybe used to call the Spanish dollar. The four would be like a half, and they're, you don't see them at all. So if this is a really odd thing that I'm gonna have to do more research about. But it kind of sh it makes me wonder because the cranes not only potentially were, d were, were minting the copper coinage, the counterfeits of the landscapes, they also were making counterfeit Spanish coins, which are um, actually were probably more of what they were making because these were, these were higher denominations and they, um, they were really popular in this area and this was just a whole new thing to get really to dig into. Okay, now we get to William Crane. So I thought this was really cool. So um, the Cranes, they kind of disappeared. So I had a hard time tracking them. I think they went to Western New York. One of them, I think Adonijah Creek ended up in um, Ohio, but um, I have some information, but as you know, it's just hard to find people who don't want to be found. And it's also just dealing with time and everything. So um, this William Crane shows up and he, um, he's definitely associated. He ends up being up like, uh, in Berkshire, um, so which is up north, right? So it's up it's getting near to Canada up there. St. Albans Daily Messenger wrote about him in 1881, but he was actually um, practicing more, uh, he was in business in the 1820s, 1830s. So he has a son named Adonijah too, which is really, it made me think, hey, there's something going on here. These guys are really, and he would have been about the age to be like, a nephew, um, a, you know, a, a grandson of, of one of those, of one of the Crane brothers. Um, I estimated he was born about 1780 or so. And so he is involved in um, engraving paper money um, that for, he did it in Canada first, right over the border there at the Cognac Street um, in 
in southern Quebec there right on the border. They would, there was a huge business um, that there was a whole setup of families there that had a, a, a whole road devoted to counterfeiting. And you, people would, from America would go up there, show them a, a picture of a banknote or whatever, and they would get the same thing. They'd get an exact copy made, and they would be able to take them down and, and spend them. And it was, it was a, a pretty notorious whole system going on there. So, but, but the counterfeiters uh, also had their own cliques, and they became um, groups of them that were kind of infighting with each other. So William Crane had, got kind of kicked out, and he got sent back into Vermont over the border there. But he was still doing his stuff in, in there because he was a really um, skillful, a skillful engraver. So he did that and um, for a while, and they get this whole story in 1881, people were reminiscing about some of the details about what he was doing. And the federal government came up and uh, they got him, they raided him, and brought him to Philadelphia. And he was apparently um, imprisoned for a little bit of time. I'm just trying to get more information on him. But he ends up, this is so funny, he ends up like um, getting out and then moving west. And he ends up in uh, Libertyville, Illinois, and I found him, or actually, and um, still doing things there, but, and we get Pinkerton, who's after him, and he's heard of him too, and he's chasing him down, and he just, he, Crane, this Queen, you see these little, um, there's those just, it's all over the place, in Michigan, there's one in Chicago, and there's mentions of Crane, the counterfeiter, and he's doing this stuff, but when you go to the history of Liberty, Libertyville, I can hardly do my book back. They they describe him. <laughs> so it says Dr. Crane came from Vermont in 1836 and took up a tract of land along the Milwaukee Road near today's Libertyville Bank and Trust and north to Lake Street. He was a veteran of the War, War of 1812. And although a physician, see, I don't even know his skin really, he was not, he did not practice in this area. So yeah, he told them he was a physician. But he was not kind instead he opened up the first hotel tavern in the village and had business interests and saw in a saw and gristmill in town. After township government was adopted in 1850, he was elected as the first supervisor, and one of his daughters married Calvin Appley, and one married Horace Butler. But I don't think they know this background of Mr. Crane, because I'm glad <laughs> he's the same man, and he, I'm, I'm going to do more work on him. It's kind of out of my area, but more because I was, I'm focused more on colonial um, numismatics, but he is just so interesting to me that I feel like um, I have to look into him more. Um, and so how I had put this to, and this was a, a, a court case that I found to try to, because it's so difficult for me to try to figure out how they were connected. But this was William Crane, and he was in a land dispute, of, um, had a suit with a, a man, and this all took place in Vermont. And one of the people who he called, who William Crane used for his um, evidence to help him with his case was Adonijah Crane. And they threw out Adonijah Crane's testimony because he was a notorious counterfeiter. So we know at that point, it's about 1820 or so. Adonijah's still alive, and I'm not sure exactly how it was all going around, but we, it's, it's, to, it's related. So it was there. So it was just kind of a neat thing. Gosh, I'm going to be. So this was my, my attempt at the Crane family tree. And um, what do we get to? I think I thought we had a more here. Um, oh, I think it's going on. Okay, so you just. So when you're talking about Abel Gilmore, the, their sister, Eunice Crane, she married um, Jabesh Moore of Rupert. So we show, it shows that, and she was, the, um, he was the son, I think, of that son. He's related, I have it in my book, <laughs> but it's, um, it shows that, that they were established in Rupert too, even, in, because this Hibbert, um, the way Hibbert tells it, it kind of makes it seem like these guys just showed up out of nowhere. They're well dressed. Everyone's kind of looking at them strangely, wondering what's up. You know what they're, and um, they're they're suspicious of them. And Judge Sheldon gets um, really starts watching them, and then he does this. He you know he tracks them down. But but there's more to it because they were here and they were living here, and 
as we said at the beginning of this, some of them, some of the family could could have stayed and be part of um, Rupert history afterwards and be part of the family tree of some of our present <laughs> residents. <laughs> so let me see. Okay, so I think I just have passed that one. I think I talked way too much. <laughs> so just slow down. I'm gonna organize this a little better. I had so much more to say. So um, this is my contact information. Anybody want to take it down and write me if you have any sort of information about this what happened here because I'm one of the big reasons why I came here. I've actually never given a presentation before. You can tell so you guys have helped me. I'm gonna do better the next time. But um, I wanted to come here and, and see the local community. Well, I wanted to see everything too. I'm not that far away and I haven't been here, but I wanted to meet some of the local community and because this is the best way. We know that there's legends, there's rumors, but there's just grains of truth in these stories, you know. Something may be completely off base, but there could be one little thing that's the reason why that story got created. And that little thing can lead you to so many more answers to it if you just can learn to weed out what's the fact, what's the legend, and try to figure out where to go and what, what to believe. And, but it's always good to have the conversation going and open and for us to try to put the little pieces together because um, so much is, you know, it's not going to be documented. It's just, we have, um, you know, just folklore that's going to get us and try to get us some answers to some of the things that are going on. And, and there's probably more information than someone might have. And might, maybe somebody has a family Bible out here about that can show us a little more about the Cranes genealogy, um, a little bit more um, detail about, you know, how, what they were doing here in Rupert. How, how were they, um, were, how were they involved in Harmless Knit? Because they really looked like they were. They had they had some kind of financial interest in there, using this Elias Jackson, one of their members, to get into the mint and to be, um, you know, a part of this whole thing. They were trying to make money off of this, but what else were they trying to do? And how did it all get started? And um, I had a great time writing about it, and I feel like I uncovered a lot of good, interesting stuff. But of course. Tons left to figure out here, and um, and I guess that's it. And it's only twelve thirty-three. I take any questions. The Ben Benjamin Talmadge is that the guy in turn? It was he the spy? Yes, the, the culture spy ring guy. See, that made me even more apt to believe kind of his so, evidence and thing. Well, yeah, he is. Yes. Already in the underworld. Kind yeah, of. he was he was on them, and, and that oh, and I showed that too. That's something I forgot to mention about Elias Jackson, and it's in my thing. Is so he I used him to connect in that whole description of the cave and everything. In like about 1750, there was a famous counterfeiter. I can't remember his name now. In Connecticut, it was another kind of a ring of counterfeiting, <laughs> and um, that Elias Jackson's father was had been. Um, prosecuted for counterfeiting in the 1750s. And that counterfeiter from that time who had that ring used a cave in Dutchess County. And it sounded so similar to the same description. And it made me think Elias Jackson is how they figured out to use this as their headquarters because his father was part of a previous counterfeiting ring that had used that same cave. Or the similar idea of his father in the cave. But it was another interesting thing. Yeah. I just want to point out a couple of things. Okay. First of all, what was Harbin's Mint was moved to a farm at some point, um, the Graf Russo farm. And I just want to point out that the Russos are in the audience tonight, this yeah, afternoon, Mike and that. Marcia. So, so why did you need metal detecting? <laughs> 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 how do you, how do you, how do you, I've heard that people have done it before. Yeah. They have. Has yeah. they found anything neat? Yeah. 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 They have found a coin? You brought one? Yeah, it's a little copper. Okay. Yeah. It's a Vermont? Yeah? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I found a George Washington button. <laughs> That's what I was going to mention too when I was showing the dandy buttons. They're, the Washington buttons are the same oh. kind of theme they were using. Yeah. They're about that size, the same yeah, kind and, of back duty. And that was not found where the mint was moved. That was found on the property. Okay. Amos Curtis is a 
have one of the land grants on the farm that we now have our farm. Okay. And mm -hmm. so they had original homestead was across the road, was on the east side. Now the main farmhouse is a huge, you know, a large farmhouse. Mm -hmm. It was built later, but the original one. And uh, I don't know, you know Ken Major? Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah he is a, his hobby is, he's a psychologist, but he, his hobby is he has, he has uh, done mental detecting. He did. Yeah, he said it's just a rich field and, you know. Yeah. Also, yeah. oh, when we put the foundation in for our home, I was up going around, I found a silver spoon in the dirt. Huh? And we took it to Bennington to the court agent, and he said it was from the Revolutionary War period. And they came up through here, and they had their lunch at that spot. Our house is. Um, Supposedly Biswell. Biswell. And it was a, a small copper spoon that they felt that was in a Revolutionary War Mets. nest kit, but it was made in England because, you know. Also, in the, back, yeah, part of, in yeah. the back part of our house, there was a still for a bootleg liquor. So it, just, uh, <laughs> it blew up once and burned the house down. <laughs> <laughs> that's the. That's the that's, <laughs> <laughs> I found a lot of uh, different artifacts. I had a metal detector. I found hinges and rings and stuff like that. Yeah. It's yeah. interesting as hell. Supposedly, they did left on their on the mm -hmm. trip to uh, Ticonderoga. Yeah, Ticonderoga. And the, the story, the, you know, it's a, it's a story, but um, my father brought me within the family a cannonball. Supposedly yeah. fell off one of the wagons. wagons we had that it, too. Yeah, and then um, we had one from the end of Conway Road. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, so it, it has a lot of history. And then my grandfather, my father's father, moved the mint from North River to Willow Farm. Oh, the building. Okay. Yes, so. I was investigating that. I, I went back and found a lot of old clippings yeah. and looking. The Dorset into Historical Society tried to convince my father to move it back, move it into Dorset. Yeah. Yeah. There's a field up here where there's a building. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was Rufus Gilbert wanted it. He said, no, no, it's fine where it is. And a lot of people, you know, there's a whole full set. You know, I think John, that you went with someone there. Yeah, WCAX did it. Yeah, did, did, did it. Yeah. And you know, they I guess they did like almost carbon dated and yeah. the way the structure is, the way that there's one beam that really right. says that, that it probably was the mint. Okay. We could stop and see it if we'd like. Oh I know. <laughs> when I was thirty and I South Wind Farm. I you know, I, I I'm just gonna get some like I looked into this before back when and I was looking at aerials and I I did pinpoint it took me a while. I was should have just called here and gotten the information, but I was figuring it all out. I'm like, oh, I think this is where it is. And I'm looking at the, the building and trying to, that's the one. Okay, that's really neat. Yeah, I didn't do it with that. Do you believe that the copper coins were made by the cranes in this area? I like to think there aren't there many of those, you know, the um, of the Rider Fives. There, um, there's only a few. I was trying to think on the way over. I was like, gosh, I should have bought my reference book, but I think we found like four or five of them. And they were done in such a weird way. And there was a recent article written about them by two numismatists, um, the two Nick and Hows, and they, because there's, they're found cast and they're found struck, and and it's like, and they're, the one that's cast has like some additional detail on it that is not in the struck. So it creates this whole like. Um, puzzle of like, and their theory was that they like cast one and then they used it as a mold, oh no, they struck one, they used it as a mold to make a casting and then they added stuff to the die and then they struck another thing. But the way that the whole idea is just, it just seems so kind of haphazard and stuff. And, it, and we have the, um, the cranes out there on the mountain and you know, they're kind of just winging it and right now, and, and I see it more like they're, they're an advanced counterfeiting thing, but they're in Vermont, kind of hiding out. They don't have all their stuff, really. They're, they're um, making do what they can up there. And, and the mint is right there, you know, right there. <laughs> Harmon's mint is, I mean, they're, of course, going to be interested in 
can make a coin. And it just seemed like such an obvious leap that we have these, these counterfeits of this landscape and no one knows where it came from. And we have these counterfeiters who are in, in Rupert and they're, you know, potentially may be making, you know, they could be making this rough coin that is really doesn't need a lot of, of even though they, they supposedly stole their minting equipment and everything, but who knows what, what that means. Could they have taken a huge, you know, or did they just take certain pieces that they were able to use to make certain things? I think they were making Spanish and I think there's a good chance they were making that one because it just, you know, where else, who else would have made that thing? <laughs> where do you think it could have come from? <laughs> I don't know. If someone made it, right? <laughs> They're the best ones. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> Any indication as to the quantity of coins that, uh, that they counterfeited, what it all added up to? Oh, gosh, no. no <laughs> this is so, you know, this is a secret here. We have, um, you know, and so much of the, the counterfeiting, you know, counterfeit coins that they, they get lost or gone. You know, people, they're, 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 yeah. they'll de destroy, melt it down. You know, people, when, when they were um, found, plucked out of commerce by people who knew what they were, they were most people are going to get rid of them. They're, you know, so, so um, we just know it, it happened. It probably happened, and we're trying to... They live comfortably, so... <laughs> they did. Yeah, they had a good time for a while, you know. It was more the paper that was um, where they made their money. I think, I'm thinking my theory is kind of like that they didn't really do too much coinage outside of Vermont, but that being in Vermont forced them to do that coinage, and also being in proximity to, to Harmon's Mint made it all kind of be more mm -hmm. facilitated. But they were involved in Harmon's Mint too, as you know. You know this, so this is all like, um, you know, kind of mixed up which came first. I think that they were involved with it first before they came to Vermont, and that was one of the reasons that they wanted to come here too. So counterfeit coins are just really legal tender cast without government authority. <laughs> and just to embarrass somebody here, um, there is someone in the audience today who is known for casting currency without government authority. Uh, the West Rutland coin system was made by Glenn Campbell over there. Yes. <laughs> so what do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I'd love to hear. What do you do? Um, I have an art foundry. Okay. In, in West Rutland, and uh, one of the things I wanted to help, although I don't think it's a trill bag, which I, I brought some. Uh -huh. you know, they're all over the planet. <laughs> um, and for a short period of time, about a half a year, um, I had an agreement with a local store in West Rutland where the trill bite was currency at the store, cool. as long as you were willing to go ahead and accept it as change if you went ahead and purchased something. <laughs> so I made, I cast probably about four or five hundred and just kind of dispersed them. Yeah. Oh, wow. It worked for about, it was like the Burlington Bucks. Yeah. Okay. It's just like the Trilobite coin. Of, uh, Did it, you need the people to actually say it that in order for it to be, like, not, the, you need to get not how many federal regulations come into play? Um, I kind of bypassed all of them. <laughs> <laughs> Are you willing to accept it? Are you willing to accept it? Every time. <laughs> they took about um, you know, a survey for a couple of weeks, and it was, the Trilobite weighed in. Uh, it yeah, weighed in at about the cost of a, co a cup of coffee and a paper. Mm -hmm. That was just worth. So you could actually, I think oh. the most expensive thing bought with a trilobite was uh, a six pack. Oh. Oh, so wow. they brought in like, you know, five trilobites. I they, definitely, uh, are you selling them now? Absolutely. I don't ever sell them, no. I give them you away. You give them away? Yeah. I think they do a penny. You, know, <laughs> you are certainly going to love them. Oh, I'd love to have it. Everyone's going to want it. Jim wants to see. I'm gonna yeah. sh I'll show this to everybody at the, um, <laughs> oh, my, I'm going to show this to all my, my, my coin collecting friends, because they're going to be very interested. Yeah, I'm a metal collector also. You are. Yeah. Where have you been? Uh, we have property in West Haven on the Foley River. Uh -huh. um, I found a couple um, copper coins that are for two cents, um, but the holy grail for me is the copper. Yeah, oh, yeah. That's, if I ever find one of those, that's a, you know. Yeah, I, I Um, copper, this is interesting that you had mentioned cast and stamped. Um, 
Copper doesn't really cast well. It's very sluggish. So the fact that she, you had mentioned that there was yeah. some brass, brass actually yes. casts well. Right? They stick brass in the cast so, Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. A lot of the um, the cast counterfeits of, I study like the um, George two and three have <laughs> pennies. Very and they're very brassy. <laughs> when you see that's how you can tell that they're, first that's, I mean, there's other factors. When you see they have the reading along the edges so that they want to um, file away like the spoon mark yeah. and yeah. stuff and um, that stuff. That's neat. That, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. That I thought it was yeah. like the money, the money reasons that like they could make brass more cheaply. It's ease, but, of, ease of casting. Wow. We All right. Alloy what copper you with uh, tin for bronze. Well, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, zinc for brass. Oh, that makes sense. Oh, I did. Yeah. Okay. Does this go up? Um, oh, I can, I, I, I have lost wax. Uh, you got one? <laughs> I did, yeah. I All take right. molds okay. of objects and cast them. put it in your hand. Thank you. I have a big history now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Brass tends to be a bit softer than the metal that I cast. Another way you can tell if something's counterfeit is if they did take a mold of copper. Where is that relative? South Wing Farm has one root That's actually going to be small. At the border of Rupert and Paul. Because it will shrink. And so that would have been the way you were out. Let's see. Let's see. Thickness is a little bit enough to be with but the diameter is going to be just a little bit. Yeah. But you see that. That's the thing. Like it, it's an interesting thing for me that I always, you know, George II was king of Britain from like 1727 to 1760, and he, um, his coins are were in America, also circulated in America. For, and they were kind of like um, the most well respected because people thought that they weren't counterfeited as much. And so and they also were better weight and stuff. You get into the George, and you saw that the Vermont I showed you, which to, that was an image that, that was what the George III looked like. Um, and his coins that Machen's Mill placed, they made exact replicas of the British half pennies of George III. They only did like one George II. But, but so the George II's were more favored, but they cast made cast copies a lot of George II and not of George III. <laughs> they made struck copies of the George III. It's this whole big thing of what you're trying to study these counterfeits, but I, I, I love them. They're so interesting. Some of these these um, counterfeits are just ridiculous. Like the um, the writer pie is pretty bad, but some of them are just. I mean, it's so bad it's good. Like I, I love it. Like I love to see them. But some of them, they, they're the struck ones, are just like comical. They look like, you know, like, they're just, you don't know what the people were doing. And if they were maybe intentionally trying to make it not look similar enough that maybe they could have a loophole that it wouldn't be called a replica of the coin. It's a little different, but it's not. But, and they would do things like, um, you know, blacken them, you know, try to make it so they look like they've already been in circulation for a while. <laughs> Strike them with shallow dyes so that they look like they've been worn down, and, and um, all sorts of things. And it's it's like really 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 cool study. <laughs> but I got way into that. Oh, all right, is there any more? <laughs> well, we've got refreshments in the other room. If you want to continue the conversation, um, I just want to thank you, everyone, and thank of course you. Julia for coming out. Thank you. Thank you. I was reluctant at first because I said I had never given a, a talk before and um, Erica contacted me was so kind and I was like <laughs> I'm just gonna do it I've got to get started doing this sometimes I just love this history I, I, I just it's just um, so much fun and also just being able to come here and hear you know some of what's going on here is just fantastic and um, I'd love to be able to come back and drive up oh, you did it again you drive you up to Pollock sometimes you yeah. want some history Oh, yeah. <laughs> All of history isn't as good as yours. <laughs> 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 there are a lot of skills in Pollock, you know, years ago. They used to make it there and take it to Grand Will. It was so short a distance. They put it in the rubber tire and the tubes of the cars, drive right to Grand Will. And got rid of it. Well, in Dorset, we imported barrels of Medford rum from Boston. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And then. They would be destroyed. Uh, they would be discovered at the rail station and destroyed. And next month, um, we're for our third Thursday lunchtime lecture, we're doing something a little bit different from today's. Um, a Time Traveler's Theory of Relativity is a young adult novel written by Nicole Valentine that takes place in several parts of Dorset history, uh, mainly in Dorset 
Hollow in Dorset Village. It was written by Nicole Valentine, and she will be here to talk about it, um, about the process of writing the book and researching it. Um, and I'm looking forward to that. Um, you can get copies of the library, uh, book at the library, I'm sure. Um, and also, shameless promotion of the Dorset Historical Society gift shop. If you want your own Harmon Mint coin, the original with the sunrise and the landscape and everything, we have them available in the gift shop. $2.50 each, or two for five dollars. <laughs> I have to warn you, they're not original. <laughs> they're from late 2021. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Thank you.